1 Corinthians 15. Verse number 58. <clears throat> we covered from 50 to 57 this morning. And so we'll focus in on verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We look this morning, verse number 50, the necessity of for the rapture and resurrection event. The necessity. Why? Because we are flesh and blood. We can't go to heaven like we are in our present condition. Then we saw the mystery, and that mystery was a truth that had not been revealed before, but it is now, verse 51 through 53, it is this, Behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. Not all believers are going to die. There's going to be a generation of believers who will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and also 1 Corinthians 15. The rapture, we call it. And so we saw the mystery of the rapture and res resurrection. Thirdly, we saw the victory of the rapture and resurrection in verse 54 through 57. And the victory comes, there's all, death has lost its sting for the believer. One day, death will never have any painful effect on you and I. We're going to heaven, there'll be no more death. No more sorrow, pain, all the other stuff that comes with it like a sting. The sting that sin brought death and death, sin brought death and all the sting that comes with it. And we saw it, and it's all through the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us and what he can do for us. We saw that in verse number 57. So here we are at 58, and we see the responsibility in light of the rapture and resurrection. Or we might say the ministry in light of the rapture and resurrection. Uh, we've mentioned that the Lord's return is imminent. Any time. We're not waiting for signs. The second coming is. But the rapture's not. It is imminent. And in light of that fact, we should prioritize our lives. Shouldn't we? We should do what we're put on earth here to do. And... So let, let's break this verse up and see just four simple truths out of it. I see what I call the conclusion. It's wrapped up in that first word. Therefore, therefore, in light of these teachings about rapture and about resurrection, about the Lord Jesus' resurrection, about the believer's resurrection, in light of all of this truth, therefore, and now he's going to go on and tell us, give us more information. H.A. Iron said, he said, anytime that you see the word therefore, you ought to ask what it is there for. Because there's a reason, certain, a reason certainly exists, he said. And that's right. Therefore, uh, having learned something, and Paul's given us new truth, hadn't he? Old Testament didn't know about the rapture. Living people never dying. Believers, and all of a sudden, boom. Glorified body, instantaneously. And so what happens? Now we got new truth. We've learned, and now he's going to take it further. 
and apply it to our living. So what is it we do now? What is it that we do now? It should affect our life. It should affect our living. Anytime you study the Bible, you should always ask those kind of questions. What should I do? What should this truth do in my life? Uh, how, how should it? Is there something that I should take out of my life? Is there something I should put in my life? Is there something that I need to prioritize in my life? Just simple questions. We, we need to be that kind of student of Scripture. So, it has to do with application. What, therefore, all right, here's some application, he says. Therefore. You know what? You should never eat popcorn before you preach. I, 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 always, get, I always get those kernels, those kernels stick. They stick in your teeth. Next thing, they're in your throat. And... <laughs> huh? Bacon, bacon, never does that. bacon doesn't. I need to try some. I, I am recording this. Who cares? It's Sunday night. The conclusion. It, what, it recording? Somebody needs out there needs to hear that you don't eat popcorn before you preach. It's a practical. We're trying to make Brother Steve applications. That's what we're talking about, you know. <laughs> Drawn from the scriptures. <laughs> oh my. The conclusion. Then secondly, I see the compassion. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren, my agape, agape, uh, Adelphos, my Agape word, beloved, they are, it's a term of endearment. He loves the Corinthians. And he labels them those who have been born from the same womb. That's the word. Those who have been born again. Those who are in the family. He counts them as those who are in the family with him. The family of God. Those He's got a heart for. Dearly beloved. Now, I would say this. Paul would have been accurate to have called them a bunch of knuckleheads. The fact of the matter, he did call them carnal. He, he, did, he did call them a bunch of spiritual babes. He told them that they were proud. Didn't he? And yet, here conclusively he's coming to the end of the letter and he says, my beloved brethren. Paul knows they have a bunch of shortcomings, but he loves them anyway. He loves them even where they are presently. Even where they are presently. With high hopes about what God will do. And where God will bring them to and create in them in days to come. So many times we write somebody off. You know, they're, 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 er, we, we just, well, you know, they're so carnal headed and they're we, fooling on that crowd and this bunch or that person. And we, we can't do that. We need Paul's spirit. He loves them in spite of them. He's still teaching them. He's still praying for them. He's still loving them. He's demonstrating 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love which he's spoken about. That love that is more than just, you know, intelligent talk. But it's real compassion for them right where they're at. So, you, you have to love people even though sometimes it's difficult. You have to love people even when it is very difficult. And that's what Paul is saying in this verse. We must have this love. Having said that, it's not necessarily natural. 
to humans. It is something that requires for God to produce in us this love. Beloved brother, nothing, the natural man says. You're a knucklehead. But God's Spirit put something in you where you can be long-suffering and patient and kind and hold back from such verbiage. <laughs> right? Beloved brethren, Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God the fruit of the Spirit is love, first one. God can create love in you. And the ability, that love would, the ability to put up with this, instruct, sure, speak the truth in love, instruct somebody, and help them. Here's what God says about this, that, or something else. Right? But at the same time, being patient, don't play God in other people's lives. Let God work on it. Pray about it. Speak the truth in love and pray about it. We'd have called the Corinthian church an apostate church. Wouldn't we? And actually it's just God working on a bunch of young converts. So... There's compassion. I see the conclusion, the compassion. Thirdly, the command. Paul gives a command. Be ye. It's a Greek imperative. It's a command of God. Here's something that's demanded of us. I would state that when God demands something... You can count on it that he will also enable you to do whatever he's commanding. And uh, he'll empower us to do it. What's, what, what are they to do? What does the Lord demand that I be? That I become? That I do? He said, be ye steadfast and unmovable. Now, why this command? Because they're in danger of being moved away from God's Word. They're, they're, it's, they're in trouble. It's evident throughout. We've studied it. The Corinthian letter. They are in danger of moving away from God's word and God's ways and God's will. Uh, now, um, be ye steadfast, unmovable. What, what is Paul saying? He's saying you need stability. You need to get stable. Don't be moved away from God's way. The ungodly Corinthian culture and teachings, Greek teachings and all of those kinds of things are pulling them away. It, it still got them thinking that there's no such thing as a bodily resurrection. Right? And it's a bad doctrine. But they're holding on to it. And some of them who believe in the resurrection are starting to fall for it. And it's leading them away. And his word said, is, beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable. Get yourself nailed down, unmovable, nailed down to some things. 
You're blown about by every wind of doctrine. This bl doctrine blows in and you jump on board with that one and the next one and you jump on board with that one and this teaching and that teaching. Listen, that sounds like modern day church in America. Just whatever. We don't know. Yes, we do. We've got the word of God. And we need to get unmovable. Steadfast. James 1.8 said, A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Get it settled. Don't move from it. The bodily resurrection is so. The rapture is so. Right? All of these other truths are so that he's been talking about. M sexual morality is so. 1 Corinthians 5. We need to get nailed down. Some things nailed down. So we're steadfast. So we're not unstable. Drifting away from God's word. Paul continues to give the command. Be ye steadfast, unmovable. And then look what he says. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. There would be three questions I'd ask from that statement that I draw immediately from that statement. Are you in the work of the Lord? And then are you always in the work of the Lord? And then are you abounding in the work of the Lord? That's what he said. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Um, the word works, the word from which we get energy. So you know what? Effort, effort is required. It is, it is the word that speaks of toil. It, it'll cause you some it, it, there'll be some battles with it all. It, it won't be easy. Always abounding, it said. Not, not just as little as possible. But always. And abounding. That, that word abounding is translated several ways. Let me give you some of the New Testament ways it's translated. Shall exceed... More abundance. Enough and to spare. Over and above. And then 1 Thessalonians 4. Increase more and more. It abounds. There's abounding. You know what that means? The work of the Lord is to be priority. Not secondary. In life. It's to be central. In life. It is gospel work. You say, what is it? Oh, it's giving financially to the furtherance of the gospel. It is telling the gospel. It's gospel work. It's kingdom work. It's work in the development of believers. In Sunday school. Teaching. Everybody doing their part. Whatever gifting God's given. See? It is obeying God's word about working in and through His church. Gospel work. Kingdom work. You know, a lot of people, they'll participate in the work of the Lord only when it's easy. Only when it's convenient. Only when it doesn't require much effort or sacrifice of any sort. Time, talent, treasure, and so on. It's funny how people will prioritize all kinds of things. They'll put their energy in all kinds of things. 
But what about God's work? This is quite an application Paul's making. He says, Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Is your life about the work of the Lord? That's what God created you for. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. For the advancement of the gospel. And that means whether you're at work or whether you're at home, a mother with children, whether, whatever. Whether you're at Walmart. I know it's hard to be a Christian there, but... <laughs> <laughs> it is not. Oh, you can have some good fellowship, can't you? At Wally World. That's Doty. <laughs> uh, the command. He concludes with a command. And then finally, what I call the cognizance. Verse 58 concludes by saying, For as much as ye know cognizance, I know something. As much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor is not empty and worthless. You can stay at it. You can, you can get stuck, nailed down in the work of God and know. Even if it doesn't seem like there's a lot of fruit or profit or those kind of things. You can know because God promised it, there is. There is. It's accomplishing His purpose in your life, in your family, in your community, and to the ends of the earth in many ways. Your labor is not in vain. It's not a waste of time. It's not a waste of uh, energy. That word, your labor, it... Uh, it, it, it says that it's the idea of being beaten. Uh, it's intense labor to the point of exhaustion, trouble, pain, exhaust, exhaustion. You, do you know that serving God does that? It, it can create pain in your life, inconvenience in your life, right? Jackie was just talking this morning about an event with family that created very uncomfortable situation. And yet you're just striving to do right. And that's all it takes. And you find yourself pained. In difficult circumstance or situation. So he says, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let me say this, that salvation is not by works. That's not what this, this is talking to the believer. And it's talking about serving the Lord, living for the Lord Jesus. And how that uh, it, it will bring much effort. It requires much effort. Salvation is a gift of God. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, but serving Him is not in vain. Do you know that this chapter talks about things that are not in vain? Uh, verse number 10 of the chapter talks about God's grace is not in vain. Verse number 14 talks about because Jesus is risen from the grave, our preaching is is not in vain. 1517 says real faith is not in vain. And then this 58th verse, of course, our work 
in the Lord is not in vain. The Lord's promised to reward us. He has. Sometimes here, well, always here. God always rewards us with his fellowship when we obey him and please him and do right and strive to serve. But he said even something as small as just giving a drink in his name. Give somebody a little water that needs it. And he said that he'd reward it. You know what that means? The Lord's paying attention to everything. He's got a close eye on it all. What you're doing. What I'm doing. In this work that he's given us. The Lord did say in Revelation 22, 12, Behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me. To give every man according to his work shall be. The Lord's coming and he's got rewards for those who are serving him. That, that should spur us on to serve him. The Lord pleased to such degree that he wants to bless us. And reward us for serving. Lost sinners need to get in the Lord. See that last three words? In the Lord. Lost sinners need to get in the Lord. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. We need to get in the Lord. And then uh, lazy, lost saint, sinners, and then lazy saints need to get in the work of the Lord. It says, because it's not in vain. Your labor is not in vain. In the Lord. Get in the Lord. And then on up in the verse it's, it speaks about in abounding in the work of the Lord. Get in the Lord. Get in the work of the Lord. See? That's what He wants us to be. We're told. We ought to serve Him urgently. Why? Because verse 52 says that in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trump, boom! Boom! You do not know, I do not know that we have got any more time. We don't know. So there is an urgency. And then not only that, wholeheartedly. Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. And then we ought to do it upwardly. It's for the Lord. We ought to do it humbly. Why? Because it's God's work. It's not ours. It's God's work. We're not bragging. Nobody's bragging and saying, oh yeah, you know, Judy, Judy Gant, and I would brag on her. Judy Gant comes, she, she could just stay at the house with Brother Curtin. She comes and thank the Lord for it and she's faithful and she's praying and she's, uh, right? But she's doing it humbly. She's not saying, oh, pay attention to me. Look all the stuff I'm doing, you guys. And you just don't understand. No, no, no. She's humble. Humbly. And then we ought to serve him sacrificially. You, you've heard the phrase, no pain, no gain. That's true. It is true. In life. Period. Oh, this is, I'm interested in comfort and easy sailing from here to the house. Forget it. Forget it. You know why? Because Bruce Sulaw is going to get a temperature and have to make a trip and figure some things out. Right? Miss Barb's going to have to tend to it. Sacrificially. Selfishly. 
or selflessly, excuse me. <laughs> Whoops. Give me a little white out. Selflessly. It's pitiful. You're going to leave out here and go, preacher said I could be selfish. <laughs> Serve him selflessly. Patiently. Our, our reward's not in this life. The bulk of our reward is not in this life. And I know the Lord rewards His children in this life. I'm not, but we're, that's not the primary. Much of it's after this life. Enduringly. That is, don't give up. Serve Him. Don't give up. You know why I say that? Because there are times whenever you're going to feel like it. Don't give up. And then ultimately, serve Him dependently. Realizing I, without you, I can do nothing. I am dependent on His power, His ability in my life to serve Him acceptably and properly. Right? How, how should these verses change my life? How should they change your life tonight? They should be a challenge to our lives. Let's stand. God's got responsibility for you. God's got ministry for you. I'll read it one more time. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Anyone have a word before we dismiss?